afternoon the next lecture in this MOOC on the Renaissance in Shakespeare will be on the romances written by William Shakespeare in the last decade of his life. This lecture will be delivered by Professor R. W. Desai, retired from the Department of English, University of Delhi. In this lecture, Professor Desai will look at the four romances and in a very interesting analysis, draw a link between the themes and issues in these four plays and what was happening in the lives of Shakespeare's two daughters at that time. Shakespeare's Daughters and the Romances Shakespeare died in 1616, exactly 400 years ago. The four romances were written during the last decade of his life. Pericles in 1608, Cymbeline in 1610, and The Winter's Tale and The Tempest in 1611. Why these four plays are called romances is a question that requires an answer. Because we might well ask whether as you like it, Twelfth Night and Much Ado About Nothing are not also romances. This term is derived from the language of the Roman Empire, which was Latin, from which the Romance languages, French, Italian, and Spanish, are descended. Since medieval literature dealt with knighthood and chivalry, the term romance was used to refer to stories that were extravagant, picturesque, and remote. As applied to these four plays by Shakespeare, what distinguishes them as romances are three striking features. First, a young woman is subjected to sexual cruelty. Second, the father-daughter bonding is prominent. And third, the women supposed dead return to life in mystical or religious circumstances. While some of these features may be present in the comedies I referred to above, they are not unique as in the romances. In the closing years of his life, Shakespeare's daughters, two daughters in fact, Susanna and Judith, were implicated. Susanna directly, Judith indirectly, in aspersions of a sexual nature. Attempts to unravel the details of Shakespeare's life are speculative, but it is possible to offer a plausible case for viewing the fragility, despite their innocence, of the reputations of these two women. Hermione, Imogen, Marina, and Miranda, impugned in varying degrees by the men in these four plays as echoing in the guise of dramatic art the anguish that Shakespeare must have felt on account of the public shame and humiliation suffered by his two daughters. Of course, he had earlier made this one of the central issues in plays like Much Ado and Othello. But the romances, with the vindication of the women, through a mystical divine intervention, present the subject from a radically different perspective. Nearly a century ago, in Ulysses, the novel written by James Joyce, Stephen, the hero of the novel, had detected a link between Hamlet and the death of Shakespeare's 11-year-old son, Hamnet, the twin brother of Judith. More recently, the interface between the two has been explored in greater detail by Stephen Greenblatt. While that between Judith and Hamnet, the twins, has been seen by Poe and Wheeler as refracted in the twin-sister-brother relationship of Viola and Antonio in Twelfth Night. 
that the death of his son coincided with the writing of what are arguably his greatest tragedy and comedy, Hamlet and Twelfth Night respectively, has thus been sensitively and revealingly explored, showing how the life of the artist is refracted and transformed in the plays. While the paucity of biographical detail pertaining to Shakespeare must always remain a lacuna in unravelling the links between the life and the work, it may still nevertheless be possible to trace filiations between the two that are suggestive. During the last decade of his life, from around 1608 to 1616, Shakespeare's family faced two serious crises involving the morality of his two daughters, Susanna, the elder one, being directly charged with adultery, and Judith, Judith, the younger one, indirectly implicated in a case against her husband, who was found guilty by the court of sexual misdemeanor that had taken place a considerable length of time prior to his marriage to her. Though blameless, both girls and the family must have been greatly disturbed by these scandals, whose origins it is more than likely predated or coincided with the last phase of Shakespeare's life while he was writing the four romances. The details are as follows. Susanna, the elder daughter, was 24 when she married Dr. John Hall, a successful medical practitioner in 1607. A year later, in 1608, their daughter Elizabeth was born. Sometime between this year and 1613, one John Lane accused Susanna of having committed adultery with two men, Rafe Smith and John Palmer, and of suffering from venereal disease. On the 15th July 1613, Susanna filed a suit against him for defamation. The court found her innocent and exonerated her of the charges, and John Lane was excommunicated by the church for slander. Since Susanna had filed suit on the 15th July 1613, as extant court records show, the assumption that John Lane's charges against her were made some time before this date is, of course, evident, though there is nothing on record to indicate as to how long before this date they were made. However, assuming they were made considerably prior to the date on which she filed suit against her accuser, in light of what you all remember, I am sure, Hamlet's The Law's Delay in his greatest soliloquy, this period could have coincided with that during which Shakespeare was writing the romances from 1608 to 1611. Surely it is more than a mere coincidence that all four plays, as we have noted, having pronounced shared features, were written during these last few years of Shakespeare's life, when the family was passing through severe emotional stress. What likely conclusions can we draw from these disturbing circumstances? The circumstances surrounding Judith's involvement, that is, the younger daughter, in a second scandal, in a sexual scandal, are more complex than was the direct attack. Uh, would you like to do this again, Manila? One slight mistake instead of second, okay, instead of in sexual. Okay. You, you, you want to? And it was in, sir, you can read that sentence again. Again? Yes, okay. that part will be edited. Okay, Ravi, stop. The circumstances surrounding Judith's involvement in a sexual scandal 
are more complex than was the direct attack on Susanna by John Lane. Judith was 31 when she married Thomas Queenie on the 10th February 1616, two and a half months before her father's death. A month and a half after the wedding, a suit was filed against her husband, charging him with having committed adultery with one Margaret Wheeler, who had died 11 days earlier in childbirth, along with the baby. As with Susanna's case, this unsavory background has come to light through court records, no other evidence being available. Accordingly, unless additional evidence is uncovered, we have no way of knowing whether Judith and her family were aware much earlier of Thomas Queenie's affair with Margaret Wheeler, an involvement which might have started at least nine months earlier, or what is more likely, long before this period. Certain related circumstances would seem to indicate that the Shakespeare family was indeed aware of this murky background. Admittedly, the details are not specific enough to warrant our drawing any definite conclusions. All that can be done is to engage in fascinating speculation, which may well be true. The background was as follows. Thomas Queenie's father, Adrian Queenie, was a close friend and neighbour of the Shakespeare family, Shakespeare having even borrowed from him thirty pounds, and he had negotiated the process of land in the outskirts of Stratford through him. Besides, he was an important member of Stratford's municipality, holding positions of alderman and town bailiff. What further complicates the situation is the friendship that existed between Margaret Wheeler's father, John Wheeler, and Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare. What this scenario, scenario shows is that the Shakespeare family had links of friendship with both the Wheeler and the Queenie families, an awkward situation for both. It has been noted by Shakespeare's biographers that the wedding of Judith with Thomas was done hastily through the grant of a court license within the period of Lent, that is, the 40 days between Ash Wednesday and Easter, when the church forbade marriage. The reason for this haste, it has been suggested, was to circumvent the danger of Thomas being forced by the Wheeler family to marry the daughter Margaret, who he had made pregnant. The question that arises is as to whether Judith was allowing herself to be used by the Queenie family so as to help Thomas wriggle out of being forced to marry Margaret, a woman he did not love, or whether Judith was so much in love with him that she was determined to have him at all costs. Either way, this would have been an embarrassment for the Shakespeare family. Regardless of Judith's and her parents' feelings, it appears that Shakespeare mistrusted his new son-in-law to the extent that he altered his will shortly before his death, so as to ensure that Thomas might never be able to lay hands on Judith's share of the inheritance from her father. If, as seems likely, Judith had a genuine emotional relationship with Thomas and therefore married him despite, possibly, her father's disapproval, then the likelihood of Shakespeare having been anxious for his daughter's happiness after her marrying Thomas, clearly a dubious kind of character, is understandable. As noted above, this was the time when he was writing the four romances. Accordingly, 
it would be fruitful to look at these four plays in the light of his concern for the reputation of his two daughters. Writing concerning James Joyce, to whom I referred earlier, Richard Elman perceptively notes that, and I quote from Elman's statement, the life of an artist differs from the lives of other persons in that its events are becoming artistic sources even as they command his present attention. Instead of allowing each day pushed back by the next to lapse into imprecise memory, the artist shapes again the experiences which have shaped him. He is at once the captive and the liberator. In turn, the process of reshaping experience becomes a part of his life." Unquote. Do the romances have features that suggest Shakespeare having shaped again the experiences which shaped him? Each of these four plays, it has often been remarked in criticism, have at their centre a young woman who faces trials of an extreme nature, yet comes through unscathed. In two of them, Pericles and the Tempest, a father's concern for his daughter's happiness is an important element. In The Winter's Tale and Cymbeline, married women, Hermione and Ibogen, are impugned for infidelity and made to experience ignominy before being finally vindicated and cleared of all charges. Besides the thematic parallels, between the trying circumstances to which Shakespeare's family was subjected and the painful trials of the heroines of these plays is the vehement and even virulent language of sexual assault levelled at them by the men in their lives. <clears throat> Marina of Pericles, a captive in the brothel, yet determined to preserve her virginity is threatened with rape by her captors so as to break her resistance and soften her up. I quote now some lines from Pericles. The board in the brothel house says, Bolt, take her away, use her at thy pleasure, crack the glass of her virginity and make the rest malleable. And Bolt replies, and if she were a thornier piece of ground than she is, she shall be ploughed. Notice the vulgar and offensive language. In Cymbeline, Posthumus imagines the scene of intercourse between his wife and Ayakimo in a paroxysm of savage and sordid imagery. I quote, this is uh, <coughs> Posthumus speaking, Oh, all the devils, this yellow Ayakima, Ayakimo, in an hour, was it not? Or less, at first, perchance he spoke not, but like a full acorn bear, a German one, cried, oh, and mounted, found no opposition, for there is no motion that tends to vice in man, but I affirm it is the woman's part. Be it lying, note it, the woman's. Flattering, hers. Deceiving, hers. Lust and rank thoughts, hers. Unquote. The sheer power and savage vividness of the imagery must give us pause. Does this derive its marvellous intensity from the amalgam of Shakespeare the man, suffering vicariously, so can we do this again, the last bit, uh, after the, the quote quotation. ends, after the quotation ends? Maybe I'll do the whole quotation, again? because there was a slight mistake. Okay. Hmm. So, Ankar, can we go back? This is the place where we can cut it. Okay. 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 Is the speed okay? Uh, yes, sir, but where you are, uh, you are referring to characters and names, 
there maybe you can slow down yeah. so that because these are not very familiar. They are not familiar. Yes. Yeah. Right <coughs> So I'll give the quotation again. Sure. The quotation. Oh, all the devils! This yellow Ayakimo in an R was it not? Or less? At first, perchance he spoke not, but like a full acorned boar, a German one, cried oh, and mounted, found no opposition, for there's no motion that tends to vice in man, but I affirm it is the woman's part. Be it lying, note it, the woman's. Flattering, hers. Deceiving, hers. Lust and rank thoughts, hers." Unquote. The sheer power and savage vividness of the imagery must give us pause. Does this derive its marvellous intensity from the amalgam of Shakespeare the man, suffering vicariously on his daughter's account, and Shakespeare the artist, transforming the suffering into dramatic speech that exhibits the fine frenzy that Theseus celebrates in his memorable description of poetic language in A Midsummer Night's Dream. It is perhaps in the winter scale that this remarkable amalgam finds fullest expression. While in general following his source, Green's Pandosto, the deviations therefrom show that Shakespeare carefully crafted the play in terms of racial and cultural notions prevalent in contemporary Europe. Thus, whereas in the source, that is Green's Pandosto, the jealous husband is the king of Bohemia in the cold northern part of Europe. In the play, Shakespeare makes him the king of Sicily, a hot southern region whose males were traditionally known for their irrational and intemperate behavior when gripped by obsessive passion or jealousy. The Oracle of Delphos, we recall, categorically brands Leontes a jealous tyrant while exonerating Hermione from any sexual blemish. Without looking minutely at specific details, our general impression of the play is that of female suffocation by male intransigence and frenzy. Leontes, consumed by jealousy, banishes his wife Hermione for 16 years on the charge of her imagined adultery. On his orders, their daughter, the baby Perdita, is abandoned in the wilderness by the cowardly Antigonus, who is then appropriately pursued and devoured by a bear. Then Polixenes justifies cross-fertilization, but in discovering his son courting a supposedly rustic girl, vindictively accuses her of practicing witchcraft. And even Camilo, though sympathetic with the plight of the wronged queen, does not have the kind of courage that, for example, Kent displays in reprimanding King Lear for his folly in casting off Cordelia, or the temerity shown by the first servant in the same play when he deals Cornwall his death wound while trying to protect Gloucester from getting blinded. In contrast to the cowardly men in the winter's tale, it is the women who stand up against the tyranny of the men. Hermione refutes her husband Leontes' accusation against her of having committed adultery. Here is a quotation from Hermione's speech. No, by my life, privy to none of this. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge that you thus have published me. Gentle my lord, you scarce can write me thoroughly then to say you did mistake. And Paulina, Antagonus's wife, denounces Leontes for his baseless suspicion. She says, this most cruel usage of your queen, 
not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy? Something savours of tyranny. Sixteen years later, Polixenes is as savage as Leontes. He threatens Perdita, his son's fiancée, that he will have her beauty scratched with briars and made more homely because of her inferior social status. But she calmly tells her fiancé Florizel, I was not much afeard. For once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly, the self-same sun that shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage, but looks on alike. Avoiding attempting to establish a one-to-one -one equivalence between biography and drama, I think it is still possible to discern what might be called an atmospheric correspondence between Susanna's maligning by John Lane and the charge of adultery to which Hermione is subjected by Leontes. His obsession comes to the fore when he declares to his little son Mamilius, and many a man there is even at this present, now while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, that little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence and his pond fished by his next neighbour. The scurrilous and baseless attack on Susanna's reputation by John Lane, smirching her with public disgrace, may well be seen as having its counterpart in Leontes' denunciation of his wife in an open forum, rejecting outright her denial of the charge and sentencing the newborn baby to death. This brat is none of mine, he stormed. It is the issue of Polixenes. Hence with it, and together with the dam, commit them to the fire. His psychotic dementia overflows with his shocking rejection of the oracle's pronouncement on his folly, which is followed by the sudden death of his son Mamilius. Leontes' abrupt turnaround and Hermione's death. There is no truth at all in the oracle, he shouts. The session shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. Following Susanna's acquittal by the Stratford court, John Lane found himself facing charges of rioting, drunk drunkenness and libelling the wicker. He was convicted on all three counts. However, unlike the swift retribution meted out to Leontes by divine intervention, the case against John Lane took its own time and judgment was pronounced six years later, in 1619, three years after Shakespeare's death, thus denying the father the satisfaction of seeing his daughter's tormentor punished. Since the plot of The Tempest is not derived from any known source, but is Shakespeare's invention, the possibility of the play reflecting the dramatist's own experience is worth exploring. Today it is considered unfashionable and even naive to equate Prospero with Shakespeare the man. But there was a time in the history of Shakespearean criticism when the belief in art as self-expression was a truism and it would be helpful if this autobiographical angle is re-examined, especially in the context of Shakespeare's situation in the Judith-Thomas Queenie marriage. As noted above, Shakespeare found himself in the embarrassing position of acquiring a son-in-law who had fathered the child of a woman, not his daughter, a situation somewhat comparable to that, that of Prospero, whose daughter has fallen in love with the son of the King of Naples who, by encouraging his brother Antonio to usurp Prospero's dukedom, was, in Prospero's words, an enemy to me, inveterate, hearkens my brother's suit. But the correspondence does not stop here. 
as distasteful a character as his would-be womanizing son-in-law must have been to Shakespeare, is Ferdinand to Prospero, who by his own admission has had affairs with numerous women before falling in love with Miranda. Ferdinand says, Full many a lady I have eyed with best regard, he confesses to her, and many a time the harmony of their tongues hats into bondage, brought my too diligent ear. For several virtues have I liked several women. That some part of Prospero finds the womanizing Ferdinand as repugnant as Shakespeare must have found Thomas Queenie is perhaps indicated in his corrective to Miranda's praise of her suitor. Miranda says of her fiancé, there's nothing ill can dwell in such a temple. If the ill spirit have so fair a house, good things will strive to dwell in it. Prospero sternly corrects her. Thou thinkest there is no more such shape, says he, having seen but him, and Caliban, foolish wench. To the most of men, this is a Caliban, and they to him are angels. And corroboration for this assumption, as already noted, may be seen in Shakespeare's alteration of his will shortly before his death, adding certain clauses to protect his daughter, should Thomas Queenie prove faithless to her. Unsure of his son-in-law's reliability, he made his elder daughter Susanna and her husband executors of his will and left to her his landed property. New Place, the Henry Street and Old Stratford properties in Stratford, and the Blackfriars Great Great Gatehouse in London, while Judith was to receive a hundred pounds as her marriage portion, as well as the interest on another hundred and fifty pounds. In the Tempest, of course, Prospero is seen to be secretly promoting the match between his daughter and Ferdinand, son of the king a union that makes his daughter the potential queen of Naples at some future time. If there is a divided self within Prospero, likewise there may have been such a condition in Shakespeare as well. For as we recall, Thomas Queenie was, after all, the son of Adrian Queenie, who was Shakespeare's close friend, to whom he had even lent 30 pounds, and through him had purchased land in the outskirts of Stratford. The picture is a complicated one, but perhaps the play does provide suggestive clues that point in plausible directions so as to shed flickering light on Shakespeare's unenviable situation in relation to his controversial son-in-law. The romances are strikingly different from the tragedies and problem plays in many respects the most noteworthy being the mystical intervention that rescues the women from the tyranny of the men, a contrast to the naturalistic fate of Gertrude in Hamlet, Ophelia in Hamlet, Cordelia in King Lear, Desdemona in Othello, and Lady Macbeth, of course, in Macbeth. Were it not for the oracle at Delphi in The Winter's Tale, Jupiter in Cymbeline, Diana in Pericles, and Prospero's magic in The Tempest, the women in these plays would undoubtedly have met the same tragic fate as those in the earlier group of plays. Equally interesting, the mystical intervention here is not Christian, but pagan. Is Shakespeare suggesting that the absence of divine intervention in the New Testament as seen in the martyrdom of John the Baptist, Stephen, and the apostles James, Paul, and Peter, would not justify its presence in the romances, and so made him turn to non-Christian intervention for effecting rescue and resolution. Whatever may have been his intent, conscious or unconscious, the oppression of women in these plays, despite their blameless conduct, is quite unlike the women of the tragedies to which I have referred earlier, all of whom are in some degree responsible for the fate that
that overtakes them. Ophelia, we recall, meekly obeys her father Polonius and returns to Hamlet the gifts he had given her. Desdemona, when asked by Othello for the handkerchief he had given her, denies that it is lost, thus confirming Othello's suspicion of her being unchaste. The young women of the romances are not tarnished by any blame and like Shakespeare's daughters seem to echo resonances of the unhappy experiences at the hands of male perfidy. And yet, miraculously, they come through the crucible unscathed. Hermione is reunited with her estranged husband, as is Imogen with her gullible husband, despite the smirching of her wifely chastity by the treacherous Aikimo. Marina escapes the ignominy of the brothel, and Miranda the danger of being raped by Caliban, while her fiancé, fearful of the punishment with which her father threatens him, should he break her virgin knot, leaves intact her virginity up to her wedding day, presided over by Juno. Caliban, we all recall, had threatened to rape Miranda, as is revealed in his exchange with Prospero, who claims to have befriended him. Caliban says, Prospero, sorry, Prospero says, this we'll have to correct. Prospero says, I have used thee filth as thou art with human care, and lodged thee in mine own cell, till thou didst seek to violate the honour of my child. To which Caliban retorts, O ho, O ho, would it have been done? Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban. But Caliban is not the only potential rapist of Prospero's daughter. Even Ferdinand, who Prospero approves of as his future son-in-law, is a potential rapist, a threat that Prospero perceives as a possibility, as is clear in his warning to the young man. Take my daughter, but if thou dost break her virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies, may with full and holy right be ministered, no sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow, but barren hate, sour eyed disdain, and discord shall beshrew the union of your bed with weeds so loathly that you shall hate it both. The vulnerability of his daughter to rape before marriage that Prospero apprehends could well have been Shakespeare's own fear for his daughter Judith, whose relationship, as we have seen with Thomas Queenie, was not without the likelihood of social stigma being thrown at her. While an accomplished dramatist like Shakespeare could view objectively the characters he had created in the play that he was writing, he was also a human being with human feelings that could well have coloured his art it is worth recalling that in Theseus' well-known description of the process whereby day-to-day -day experiences are transformed in the crucible of the poet's imagination into a local habitation and a name, the lines are, the poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes. Clearly, Theseus sees a link between the poet's eye and the products of his pen, and it is this link that we have tried to identify in Shakespeare's writing of the romances. All of these young and innocent women teeter on the brink of ruin, but are then miraculously rescued by supernatural intervention. Shakespeare left behind no letters, diaries or journals. Unlike Ben Jonson, he never published his own plays, a neglect lamented by the editors of the folio, who in their note to the great variety of readers wished that the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writing. It is only by extrapolation from his plays and poems 
and from the scattered memoirs of his contemporaries that something of the man behind the work can be glimpsed. In conclusion then, it seems difficult to resist seeing the endings of the romances as embodying the complete and satisfying fulfillment of a father's wishes for the happiness of his daughters in a world of evil and male oppression. If in the tragedies Shakespeare showed us what life is, in the romances he gives us a vision of what life ought to be. Shakespeare's History Plays Shakespeare's English History Chronicle Plays from Richard II to Richard III cover a historical span of 108 years, from 1377 to 1485, after which began the Tudor period with Henry VII, which includes the reign of Queen Elizabeth. However, the writing of the Henriette plays by Shakespeare did not follow their historical sequence, and this is a factor we must take into account in our study of the plays. Thus, though Richard II in history died in 1400 and Henry VI in 1471, Shakespeare wrote the Henry VI plays in 1591 and Richard II in 1594 in inverse order. Likewise, the historical Henry V died in 1422 and Richard III in 1485, 60 years later. But Shakespeare wrote Richard III in 1592 and Henry V seven years later in 1599, again in inverse order, thus giving rise to a proleptic view of events. That is, we see future events first, then past events. The development of Shakespeare's dramatic art then is at variance with the location of the plays in history. The outcome being that the plays he wrote later, like Henry IV, parts one and two, have such unforgettable characters as Falstaff, Hal, later Henry V, Hotspur, and Richard II, contrasting with the comparatively immature style of Henry VI parts 1, 2, and 3. Later, in this paper, we will look more closely at this interesting anomaly. Turning then to the later plays in the chronology, Richard II, Henry IV, parts 1 and 2, and Henry V, our focus will be on two aspects of these plays. One, Shakespeare's view of politics in the context of historical events and two, the memorable characters as already briefly noted and their role in the politics of the period. In passing, we should note that one of the recent critical approaches to literature is new historicism in which strong emphasis is laid on two factors. First, that the literary text is embedded in its own cultural and social time and place and, therefore, should be studied in the light of its historical context. And second, that the writing of the literary text could well have been influenced by conditions that might seem too remote to have played a role in the shaping of the text. And yet, if studied carefully, might uncover some remarkable traces of influence that could well compel us to rethink our interpretation of the text. For example, in Henry IV Part I, nearly half of the play consists of the unhistorical scenes of Falstaff, the Fat Knight, and his companions in the tavern. And these scenes, if closely analyzed, might well be regarded as ironical and witty commentary on the serious scenes of grave political import with which the high-class members of the aristocracy are occupied. 
This sniping from the underground, so to speak, is not a feature of the earlier plays, like Henry VI, parts 1, 2 and 3, or Richard III, which are fully occupied with history, having no room for low comedy. What we may well ask was Shakespeare's view of history. 19th century criticism's answer was that his view was based on hence, if a prince wishes to maintain himself, he must learn how to be not good and to use that ability or not as is required. Shakespeare was, of course, as were all English writers, greatly influenced by the Italian thinkers. We are only to remember that almost all of the plots of his plays came from Italian sources. And in England, we have only to turn to Francis Bacon's metaphoric observation that, I quote, all rising to great place is by a winding stair. To note its relevance to Bowling Brooks, that is Henry IV, he became Henry IV later, confession to his son Hal, later Henry V, I quote, God knows my son by what bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown, and I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. As some of you no doubt know, it was Richard II who banished Bolingbroke for six years, when the one-to-one -one combat between Bolingbroke and Mowbray was about to take place, each having accused the other of high treason against the king. The king then banished Mowbray for life and extracted from both of, both of them a promise to respect his sentence and never plot against him or the throne. Up to this point in the play's action, Richard's authority is undisputed, in accordance with the doctrine of the divine right of kings, as, for example, stated by Thomas Hooker's 1586 to 1647 ecclesiastical polity. Kings, I'm quoting from Hooker, kings, therefore, no man can have lawfully power and authority to judge. If private men offend, there is the magistrate over them which judgeth. If magistrates offend, they have their prince. If princes offend, there is heaven, a tribunal, before which they shall appear. On earth they are not accountable to any. This is a note uh, which we can uh, relate to the great chain of being, the theory that there is a hierarchy which is observed in all forms and patterns of nature, whether pertaining to actual nature or to human nature. In the play itself, Bolingbroke's father, John of Gaunt, endorses this belief. Let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. And later in the play, Richard himself invokes heaven to defend his cause. God for his Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then, if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. This simple, straightforward assertion of faith in the king being impregnable against challenges to his authority is, however, shown to crumble in the face of worldly might and political strategy, for at play's end, Richard is forced to abdicate by Bolingbroke and dies at the hands of an assassin. Thus is called in question the notion of the divine right of kings. But a further complication ensues, which Shakespeare explores and develops with fine psychological insight, namely the pangs of conscience that now haunt Bolingbroke and run like a thread through the two parts of Henry IV, Shakespeare's most mature and gripping of all his history plays. We will now consider briefly some instances of the psychological insight of Shakespeare just mentioned, which shifts the reader or the viewer's attention 
away from divine providence to the human dimension in worldly affairs, thus rendering his plays timeless. As Dr. Johnson noted, Shakespeare is above all writers a poet of nature, the poet that holds up to his readers a faithful mirror of manners and of life. Henry IV Part I opens with Bolingbroke, now King Henry, longing to set out on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, in order to do penance for having usurped the crown from Richard, and thus assuage the gnawings of his troubled conscience. But continuously he is thwarted by various circumstances. As he himself said, but this our purpose now is twelve month old, and bootless is to tell you we will go. Ironically, on his deathbed, at the end of Henry IV, part two, he ruefully laments, never having been able to realize his dream due to his failing health, and asks an attendant lord to convey him to the chamber named Jerusalem, where he may die in peace. It has been prophesied to me many years I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I supposed the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie, in that Jerusalem shall Harry die. Henry is a complex character, portrayed as ambitious and unscrupulous, yet eliciting our sympathy for his sensitivity and introspection, thus anticipating in certain ways Shakespeare's creation of a far more memorable character, Macbeth, who, like Henry, cannot resist succumbing to the temptation of securing the crown, yet is tormented by his restless conscience. To add to Henry's predicament is the anguish he feels over the manner in which he was forced by political necessity to take decisions for the public good that he personally and privately abhorred. Struggling against the trap in which he finds himself a captive, he discusses with the Earl of Warwick the way in which men are drawn into the vortex of historic, historical necessity, not so much by choice as because they fit in with the shape that events take, and so are enlisted by the forces of political compulsion to fulfill their inescapable destiny. Henry, by this reasoning, absolves himself of personal guilt in the deposition of Richard and blames the events that compelled him to become a factor in the formula that history was evolving. Though then God knows I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I in greatness were compelled to kiss. The Earl of Warwick's reply is strongly reminiscent of Cassius's view in Julius Caesar, a play that I'm sure many of you know very well, of freedom and determinism warring with each other is not in agreement with Henry's self-exoneration, but places an equal responsibility on the individual's freedom to make the right choice in terms of moral and ethical principles. In other words, Warwick insists that each individual is accountable for the choices he or she makes. He says, there is a history in all men's lives, figuring the natures of the times deceased. Is then history the biography of certain individuals? Do we agree with Henry or with Warwick? At this stage of his dramatic and theatrical career, Shakespeare was grappling with questions that are relevant for us today. How do we define words like nationalism, patriotism, tolerance, intolerance, freedom of speech? While Henry IV is addressing the problem of freedom and determinism, this does not prevent him from being a canny politician, even on his deathbed. He advises his son Hal, later Henry V, to use political acumen in distracting the minds of the people from thinking of these issues by the cunning strategy of waging foreign wars. 
Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. How well Harry learns this lesson is the mainspring of Henry V, the play that we will now examine in some detail. Having heard his father's advice to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels, Hal heeds it to the letter. Henry V is replete with wars waged against France, but we must remember that these wars were fought by men like the groundlings, who, watching the play, saw themselves as pawns to be sacrificed on the battlefield, so as to secure the continuing authority of the aristocrat rulers and politicians. Thus Shakespeare's history plays were a powerful lesson exposing the subterfuges and the exploitation of the common people in the name of patriotism and nationalism. Henry V whips up support for his kingship with a stirring exhortation, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. But the rhetoric may well have sounded hollow to many in the audience who saw through its ulterior motive and resisted being dazzled by its celebration of military valour and reckless warmongering. By turning now to an examination of the comedy scenes in these plays, in which Falstaff plays a major role, we will realise that Shakespeare included these scenes not merely to provide entertainment, but also to expose through them the hypocrisy of the ruling class. In one of the most extraordinary scenes in Henry IV Part II, Falstaff is shown recruiting soldiers from the lower strata of society with cynical contempt for their simplicity and naivety. Falstaff and Justice Shallow are in charge of the recruitment. Shallow says, where's the role? Where's the role? Where's the role? Let me see, let me see, let me see. So, 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 so. Yea, marry, sir. Ralph Moldy. Let them appear as I call. Let them do so. Let them do so. Let me see. Where is Moldy? Moldy. Here and please you. Shallow. What think you, Sir John? A good-limbed fellow, young, strong, and of good friends. Falstaff. Is thy name Moldy? Moldy. Yes, and please you. Falstaff. Tis the more time thou wert used. Shallow. Ha, 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 ha. Most excellent effect. Things that are mouldy lack use. Very singular, good in faith. Well said, Sir John. Very well said. Falstaff, prick him. Mouldy. I was pricked well enough before, and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now for one to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You need not to have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. Falstaff, go to peace, mouldy. You shall go, Moldy. It is time you were spent. Moldy, spent? The scene is both hilarious and deadly serious. Beneath the hilarity is corrupt practice. Bribes from the more well-to-do recruits were taken by Falstaff's corporal so that they may escape enlistment. And when the army finally is formed, it consists of tatterdemalion men totally unfit for battle. On seeing the men, Hal remarks, I did never see such pitiful rascals. To which Falstaff replies, Tut, tut, good enough to toss. Food for powder, food for powder. They'll fill a pit as well as better. Tush, man, mortal men, mortal men. Hal continues to be shocked. I, but Sir John, methinks they are exceeding poor and bare, too beggarly. Is Falstaff hard-hearted and callous towards the men who will be cannon fodder? Or is he a hard-nosed realist who knows how in any war the worst sufferers are the soldiers who die or are wounded on the battlefield? Exposing the hollowness of the notion of valour 
cultivated by the politicians who are responsible for conflicts. Falstaff's soliloquy on the notion of honour has been ranked by many readers as being on par with Hamlet's famous soliloquy to be or not to be. That is the question. In the first part of Henry IV, before the Battle of Shrewsbury begins, the Prince and Falstaff have a brief exchange. Falstaff says, Hal, if thou see me down in the battle, and bestride me so to the point of friendship. Hal, why, thou owest God a death. Falstaff, it is not due yet. I would be loath to pay him before his day. What need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Well, tis no matter. Honour pricks me on. Yea, but how if honour prick me off? When I come on, how then? Can honour set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honour hath no skill in surgery then? No. What is honour? A word. What we may well ask is Shakespeare attempting in these scenes. One answer is of course that he is satirising the corrupt state of affairs in the English army. Queen Elizabeth's sanction of funds for the army was pitifully inadequate on account of her determination to build up a strong navy. As all of you no doubt are aware, in 1588 England had repulsed the Spanish Armada, and won a great victory over Spain. Since then the Royal Navy had become invincible, plundering the Spanish ships that carried bullion back to Spain from South America, thus enriching the coffers of the English Queen, who as a consequence neglected the army, giving rise to the kind of corruption witnessed in the scene with Falstaff and Moldy. But Falstaff is not entirely a parodist of the higher political goings-on in the country. In the second part of Henry IV, he captures Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But Falstaff is not entirely a parodist of the higher political goings-on in the country. In the second part of Henry IV, he captures Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy, as Falstaff describes him, with his usual dose of wit. The scene is both comical and serious, a technique that Shakespeare perfected in the creation of Falstaff, and continued to use with telling effect in all of his subsequent plays. For example, in Antony and Cleopatra, the rustic who brings the asp, whereby Cleopatra commits suicide, loves to use big words that being without being too sure of their meaning. When Cleopatra asks him, Hast thou the pretty worm of Nilus there that kills and pains not? His reply is comical. Truly, I have him, but I would not be the party that should desire you to touch him, for his biting is immortal. Those that do die of it do seldom or never recover. The bribery and corruption that Falstaff and his corporal practice is a replica of that prevailing among the upper echelons of society. But Falstaff's inimitable wit and perpetual gaiety are redeeming factors. Recognizing the combination of opposites in Shakespeare's creation of Falstaff, Dr. Johnson addresses Falstaff as a personal friend and companion. But Falstaff Unimitated, unimitable Falstaff, how shall I describe thee? Thou compound of sense and vice, of sense which may be admired but not esteemed, of vice which may be despised but hardly detested. Falstaff is a character loaded with faults, and with those faults which naturally produce contempt, he is a thief and a glutton, a coward and a boaster, Yet the man thus corrupt, thus despicable, makes himself necessary to the prince that despises him by the most pleasing of all qualities, perpetual gaiety, by an unfailing power of exciting laughter.
This is Dr. Johnson's description of Falstaff. Yet despite Prince Hal's ostensible friendship with Falstaff, and I stress the word ostensible, at the end of the second part of Henry IV, when Hal becomes king on the death of his father, he rejects Falstaff and banishes him till such time as he reforms himself and becomes a good citizen. This scene has become one of the central subjects for critical discussion and controversy and needs to be examined more closely. At the beginning of the first part of Henry IV, Hal had declared in soliloquy that his plan is to reject Falstaff after he becomes king, so as to show his subjects how complete his commitment to good kingship is. A speech that for some critics is evidence of political expediency and calculatedness unworthy of a king, but for others an indication of a shrewd sense of the need to cultivate a popular public image and therefore a proof of his potential to be a good ruler. In soliloquy, he addresses Falstaff and his companions thus. I know you all and will a while uphold the unyoked humour of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wonder at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapours that did seem to strangle him. So, when this loose behaviour I throw off and pay the debt I never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. And like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation, glittering o'er my fault, shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend, to make offence a skill, redeeming time, when men think least I will. The rejection of Falstaff by Hal at the end of the second part of Henry IV breaks Falstaff's spirit, and in Henry V he dies of a broken heart. For those of you who are captivated by Shakespeare's creative genius, displaying itself in the person of Falstaff, and who are fascinated by the abundance of contradictory ingredients that go into his making, my advice is that you read the deeply moving account of his death by the hostess in Henry V, Act 5, Scene 3, and then try to examine critically your assessment of Falstaff. There is a considerable school of criticism that sees Falstaff and Hamlet as Shakespeare's two most remarkable characters. Hal's speech on his intention to reform himself and thus impress his subjects anticipates in some ways the soliloquy by the hunchback Richard III who plans to be ruthless and totally self-serving so as to attain the crown and thus compensate himself for the physical deformity with which nature has made him suffer. Some of us may feel that Hal's speech is a callous betrayal of friendship at the altar of self-promotion. Others may feel, as did Dr. Johnson, that the soliloquy prepares the audience for his future reformation. But the truth is that Shakespeare's hands were tied by history. The early chronicles describe Hal's wild youth which he renounced on becoming king, so that Shakespeare had no alternative to incorporating this into the text of his play. Here, as we shall see in greater detail later, is a draw drawback that the dramatist using history as a base has to contend with. Here, as we shall see in greater detail later, is a drawback that the dramatist using history as a base has to contend with history dictating the plot and perhaps going against the grain of the dramatist's own creative judgment. This is an issue that each reader must come to terms with 
using personal judgment as a guide. An example of the way in which literature challenges us to react one way or another, depending upon our own critical faculties. Towards the conclusion of the second part of Henry IV, Shakespeare gives us a highly dramatic scene in which Henry IV on his deathbed finds his crown missing from the pillow and is told by his attendants that Hal had taken it away. King, where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? Warwick, when we withdrew my liege, we left it here. King, the prince hath taken it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick. Chide him hither. In any stage enactment of this scene, the crown becomes a powerful symbol of the goal for which aspirants strive, fight and perish. We should note that while Shakespeare gives us a dramatic version of history, he is at the same time giving us a lesson on the futility of the lust for power and fame, a lesson that Tolstoy gives us in his short story, How Much Land Does a Man Require? Are then the history plays intended to undercut the glory and the grandeur that is associated with the monarchy? The martial music, the trumpets, soldiers marching in perfect formation, the speeches celebrating military valor and national honor? And if so, why was Shakespeare not arrested by the authorities for thus sowing the seeds of discord among the common people? The answer to this question will be found, I suggest, in the willingness of the Queen to accommodate a wide range of attitudes and views in the governance of the country. A couple of years before her death, she addressed Parliament with affectionate humility. Though God hath raised me high, yet this I count the glory of my crown, that I have reigned with your loves. There will never Queen sit in my seat with more zeal to my country, care for my subjects, and that sooner with willingness will venture her life for your good and safety than myself. For it is not my desire to live nor reign longer than my life, and reign shall be for your good. I unquote. Another possible explanation for the censor board not taking exception to criticism of prevailing conditions, could well be the long past historical context of the chronicle plays. Shakespeare wrote, going back to the 14th and 15th century, a good 150 years prior to the reign of Queen Elizabeth, and therefore immune from censure. However, members of Shakespeare's audience who were perceptive could have seen through the veil of history and recognize the contemporaneity of the plays and the message they contained. An interesting instance of this was the staging of Richard II two years before the Queen's death in the hope that the deposition of Richard by Bolingbroke would alert the populace to the possibility of James VI of Scotland, son of Mary Queen of Scots, succeeding Queen Elizabeth to the throne of England. The details of this episode are as follows. Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, handsome, bold, ambitious, and a favorite of the Queen, went to war against Spain and captured the important port city of Cadiz. As a result of this success, his reputation soared immensely, and he next persuaded the Queen to send him to Ireland with an army of 15,000 men to quell the Irish Rebellion of 1599. However, the expedition proved a failure. The Queen was furious, and Essex felt insulted and humiliated. It was at this point that Essex and his friends stormed into London and arranged for the performance of Richard II by Shakespeare's acting company, with the hope that the citizens of the city would rise in rebellion and depose the Queen. Know ye not that I am Richard? The Queen said to her supporters. Essex was brought to trial. 
the chief prosecutor being Francis Bacon, convicted of treason and executed. Essex, rise and fall, greatly disturbed the nation. And according to some eminent critics, like John Dover Wilson, it may not be a simple coincidence that in the same year, Hamlet was written. Apart from the Henriade Chronicle plays, Shakespeare also wrote in 1596, The Life and Death of King John, which features between the early Henry VI plays and the later, more uh, sophisticated and mature Henry IV and Henry V plays. Historically, it goes back to the 13th century, to the Magna Carta. King John may be regarded as a transitional play that combines the characteristics of both periods, while at the same time containing at least three outstanding scenes. One, the likelihood that Constance's lament over the death of her son Arthur reflects Shakespeare's grief over the death of his 11-year-old son Hamnet in 1596. Two, the pleading of Arthur with the assassin Hubert to spare his life and his subsequent death. And three, the bastard, who in many ways is a precursor of Falstaff and Edmund in King Lear. Here are some lines from Constance's lament over the death of Arthur. Grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Whether Shakespeare wrote these lines with the kind of artistic detachment that James Joyce's Stephen in Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man believes is the hallmark of great writing, or whether they reflect in some way his own personal loss in the death of his son, is a question that each reader must answer individually. King John, as noted, was an interlude in the writing of the Henriade plays. So our survey of the Henriade plays brings us back to the three parts of Henry VI, glanced at briefly at the commencement of this paper. As noted, these three parts were written much before the later Henry IV and Henry V plays, thus giving us a projectic view of history, by which is meant an inversion of history. This may seem confusing, but on closer examination may turn out to be more enlightening than the conventional linear view of history as cause and effect. If we reverse the sequence, we first see the effect and then the cause, a bipolar view of history in which hindsight can give us a new kind of insight into historical change and circumstance. Those of you who are interested in the subject will want to read the three parts of Henry VI and will, I fear, initially be repelled by the complexity and plethora of characters that interact with one another. In all three parts, there are no less than 100 characters. As Peter Alexander points out, the England of medieval times was riven by civil disorder. Each feudal leader, duke, earl, or baron, having his own coterie of followers, similar to the many rajas, maharajas, and nawabs, who had their fiefdoms in India, until such time as the Mughal Empire in the north and Shivaji in the south united the major part of the country, followed by the British who further consolidated its political structure. Of course, these are broad generalizations. Hence, without going into particulars, it can be said that with the Battle of Bosworth and the crowning of Henry VII, under the Tudors, we see the end of the feudal epoch the rise of the middle class to political significance and the realization of the idea of the state. This is an incisive comment by Peter Alexander, one of the leading Shakespeare scholars, particularly with reference to the history plays. In passing, it is worth noting that the chaos and endless conflict of the Wars of the Roses, the Red and White Rose, that sets in during this period of English history as a result of the hostility between the two houses 
of Lancaster and York, both being descendants of King Edward III, has its parallel in the Mahabharat, with which all of you are no doubt familiar, in the rivalry between the Kauravs and the Pandavas, both being descendants of King Santanu and his wife, Queen Satyavati. In both cases, the rival parties are cousins, demonstrating that history often throws up patterns that are similar, human nature being the same regardless of time and place. The turmoil that sets in with the Wars of the Roses culminates with the rise of the hunchback King Richard III, who determines to win the crown by hook or by crook. Deformed and repulsive in looks, his bitter soliloquy is an admission of his grudge against the world and is the first great psychological study by Shakespeare of an embittered soul from whom we recoil in horror, who yet kindles in us some feelings of sympathy. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb, and, for I should not deal in her soft laws, she did corrupt frail nature with some pride, to shrink my arm up like a withered shrub, to make an envious mountain on my back, where sits deformity to mock my body, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportionate me in every part, like to a chaos. And am I then a man to be beloved? Oh, monstrous fault to harbour such a thought. Then since this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, to o'erbear such as are of better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live, to account this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown. For many lives stand between me and home, and I, like one lost in a thorny wood that rends the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking a way and straying from the way, not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown. And from that torment, I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile and murder whilst I smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears and frame my face to all occasions. I'll drown more sailors than the mermaid shall. I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk. I'll play the orator as well as Nestor. Deceive more slyly than Ulysses could. And like a Simon, take another Troy. I can add colours to the chameleon. Change shapes with Proteus for advantages. And set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this and cannot get a crown? But when it's further off, I'll pluck it down. As is evident in this devastating soliloquy, Shakespeare anticipates the workings of Macbeth's mind, of Claudius' schemings, of Edmund's villainy, while at the same time exposing the machinations of all politicians in all ages, including our own, to win votes by deception and hypocrisy. Hateful as Richard may seem on one plane, on another he emerges as a single dominating and energetic figure, a contrast to the preponderance of characters in the Henry VI plays, thus giving us Shakespeare's view of history as a movement towards the unification of the country politically. Richard perishes in battle with Richmond, Henry VII, at the end of the play, after which Henry VII has the last word. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled, that in submission will return to us. And then, as we obtain the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me and says not Amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. Now civil wounds are stopped, peace lives again, that she may long live here 
God say, Amen. In the portrayal of Richard III, we can detect the seeds that were to germinate and give rise to the creation of the great villains of the later tragedies, like Claudius, Macbeth, Iago, and Edmund. In writing the English history plays, Shakespeare was inevitably restricted by historical necessity, even though he did take liberties with historical fact at times while adhering to the broad outlines of history. The history plays then were in some sense a training ground for Shakespeare to probe cause and effect, boundless ambition followed by disastrous consequences, self-aggrandizement by using others as dispensable pawns in the way of advancement. So that by the time he wrote Hamlet in around 1600, he was able to create an amalgam of history and insight into the intricacies of human aspiration, endeavor, and the workings of conscience. With Hamlet, Shakespeare seems to have deliberately turned away from English history, which he found too restrictive and went to Danish history, dating back to the 12th century AD in the Historia Danica by Saxo Grammaticus. This camouflage was but a thin disguise for the ongoing politics of England at the time. The Queen's death, everyone knew, was not far off, and the absence of an heir was a cause for much anxiety. As the historian Trevelyan observes, for 40 years and more, the English had lived in the black shadow of the question, what will befall us when the Queen dies? Even though the Spanish Armada had been repulsed and routed in 1588, as we saw earlier, it was well known throughout Europe that Spain continued to have imperialistic designs against England, not only in terms of an old rivalry, but on account of the English Navy, as we have noted, plundering Spanish ships laden with bullion from South America on the high seas, as well as the threat of the up-and-coming East India Company, posing stiff competition to Portugal's presence in India, Portugal and Spain having been united under a single crown from 1580 to 1640. While Hamlet is strictly speaking not an English chronicle play, it can be seen as an extension of the same in the form of a Danish veneer. The successor to the old King Hamlet is his brother Claudius, who, like Richard III, can smile and smile and be a villain, as Hamlet notes. He marries Gertrude, he has elder brother's widow, even as in Henry VIII's, as Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine, was the widow of his elder brother, Arthur. And at the play's end, Fortinbras of Norway walks in without a fight and gains possession of Denmark, even as James VI of Scotland, son of Mary, Queen of Scots, Elizabeth's cousin, stepped in without a fight and occupied the throne of England. Like Denmark and Norway, between whom an uneasy truce existed, every now and then, marred by skirmishes, as is reported in Act 1, Scene 1 of Hamlet, the relations between England and Scotland were and are similar, as is evident from the likelihood of Scotland breaking away from the Union of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, should a referendum be held today. Further, the role of Falstaff to provide satirical comedy directed against the high politics, intrigue and treachery prevalent in the English history plays finds a yet more trenchant expression in the roles of the gravedigger in Hamlet, the porter in Macbeth, Edmund in King Lear, and Iago in Othello, Odin describing him as the joker in the pack. All of these characters disrupt the trajectory of the tragedies in various ways too complex for us to analyze in the limited time at our disposal. Though it can briefly be said that each of them seems to deflect the play's action into an unexpected channel that both surprises and educates the audience. In Hamlet, the gravedigger scene, as Maynard Mack has pointed out, is responsible for Hamlet's considerable change of mood, as seen in his acceptance of the boundaries in which human actions are enclosed. 
which Bradley erroneously called, termed fatalism. Hamlet then may be regarded as being not only the culmination of the turmoil of the English chronicle plays, but as a kind of a resolution as well. Towards the play's end, Hamlet realizes there is a divinity that shapes our ends, and there is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. He succeeds in revenging his father's murder, but he accomplishes it under the aegis of providence, thus introducing a new dimension in the unraveling of history in the earlier period. As Lord Rees Mogg perceptively notes, if one looks at earlier and contemporary English history when Hamlet was written, it is a fact that every English monarch had been forced by political events or had decided to execute or murder a kinsman or a kinswoman in order to retain power. And that, after all, is what Claudius did. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, Marcellus observes, and Hamlet a few lines later accepts the responsibility that is now his. The time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Unlike the bloodthirsty aspirants to power of the history plays, Hamlet is a reluctant agent of justice. As Lord Rees-Mogg further observes, on one level, Hamlet is always a little way behind Claudius, who seems to be taking the initiative at every turn. But on another level, perhaps in a more fundamental way, Hamlet is ahead of Claudius, precisely because he is not limited by the politician's perspective as Claudius is. Hamlet, the intellectual, can look before and after, something Claudius is incapable of doing. With the writing of Hamlet, then, Shakespeare concludes the saga of the English chronicle plays and begins a new chapter with the great tragedies, Othello, Macbeth, King Lear, and Antony and Cleopatra. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, and these plays were written after James I of Scotland had become the new King of England. The political climate had undergone a radical change. Whereas under Elizabeth, the Navy had prospered, and England had asserted her maritime rights. Under James, she lost the supremacy, and England lost out to Spain, France, and Holland in the competition for supremacy, both in Europe as in distant lands, both east and west of England. In India, for example, the Portuguese had established colonies in Goa, Daman, and Diu, while the French presence under Duplay had gained political, commercial, and military superiority over the English presence under Lord Clive. While reading Shakespeare's history plays, we must always bear in mind that they were being written during the reign of Queen Elizabeth and were therefore viewed in retrospect from the perspective of the Queen's glorious reign. In other words, Shakespeare's view of history is coloured by the belief that history comes to its fullest and most lofty fulfilment with the reign of the Queen. I am not suggesting that this phenomenological view was incorrect or subjective. On the contrary, history has fully vindicated the Queen's rule for its many spectacular achievements, among which is the defeat of the Spanish Armada and the establishment of the East India Company in 1600. It now only remains for us to look at the last of the Henry plays, Henry VIII that was staged at the Globe in 1613, three years before Shakespeare's death, and ten years after the Queen's death. As we might expect, the play is more a pageant than a play, celebratory of the Queen's birth in 1533, and the prophecy at the time of her long and glorious reign to be followed by that of her successor, James I of Scotland. The Archbishop of Canterbury prophesied, this royal infant, heaven still move about her, though in her cradle, yet now promises upon this land a thousand thousand blessings, which time shall bring to rightness, and concludes with a tribute to James I, so shall she leave her blessedness to one, when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honour shall star-like rise as great in fame as she was, and so stand fixed. The play is by no means devoid of great speeches, even though, for
for obvious reasons, there is no dramatic suspense worth mentioning. One such speech is the denunciation of Cardinal Wolsey by Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Spain, and the first wife of Henry VIII. You are my enemy, and make my challenge, you shall not be my judge. For it is you have blown this coal betwixt my Lord and me, which God's you quench. Therefore I say again, I utterly abhor, yea, from my soul refuse you for my judge, whom yet once more I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. The play's most remarkable scene is the fall of Cardinal Wolsey, from the king's favour for his ill-gotten wealth, followed by Wolsey's moving lament. Had I but served my God with half my zeal, I served my king, he would not in my age have left me naked to my enemies. In conclusion, it is important that we understand how difficult it is to convert history into drama. The play enacted on the stage cannot exceed three hours. No audience can sit through a span of time longer than this. Least of all Shakespeare's audience, which consisted of a large percentage of groundlings, who were required to stand in the open space in front of the stage for the length of time. Accordingly, Shakespeare had to compress historical time so as to make it fit into the limited span of two hours of dramatic time. And this necessitated his having to make a selection of episodes from history and weave them into a unified and composite whole so as to form a pattern that could be grasped and comprehended by his audience. In modern times, with the marvel of cinematography at the disposal of film directors, the task of accomplishing what Shakespeare had to do without this technology is indeed a miracle. It is imperative, therefore, that we realize that Shakespeare's history plays are not historical documents, but rather highlights and impressions of historic moments that have been chosen highly selectively, that have at times been transposed, rearranged, magnified, and thus rendered dramatic, so as to make a powerful impact on the minds of the viewers. We must not read Shakespeare's chronicle plays as historians would expect, but as spectacular renderings of events out of history, which because of their having been captured in Shakespeare's vivid and inimitable language, give us insights into the essence of historical truths, which transcend mere historical fact. In other words, Shakespeare's plays are concentrated microcosms of history, similar to the way in which a diamond is composed solely of carbon. In 1901, W. B. Yeats was at Stratford on Avon and saw the history plays performed in their right order. He was deeply stirred by the experience and noted, I quote, the theatre has moved me as it has never done before. That strange procession of kings and queens, of warring nobles, of insurgent crowds, of courtiers, and of people of the gutter has been to me almost too visible, too audible, too full of an unearthly energy. We must but give to Aristotle the last word on the distinction between drama and history. I quote from Aristotle's, the poetics, which all of you know, hence poetry, that is drama, is something more philosophic and of graver import than history since its statements are of the nature rather of universals, whereas those of history are singulars or particulars.